As the football connects with the laces of Riley Patterson's cleat on a very cold Saturday night in January, 70,000 fans in Northeast Florida are clenching their jaws and probably everything else. 36 yards separates their team from completing the third largest comeback in NFL playoff history. Now, Chargers fans don't really travel well, so the stadium was exclusively a sea of teal and black. Everyone's ready to explode as their team knocks on the doorstep of the AFC elite. How the hell did they get within a field goal? Well equipped with a roster full of unassuming yet talented players, many of which have been passed on by much of professional football, led by one of the league's most highly touted young quarterbacks who was deemed a generational prospect only a season prior. Paired with a Super Bowl winning head coach who had been abandoned by his former team shortly after reaching the sport's highest achievement, the Jacksonville Jaguars have rightfully earned the respect of their NFL counterparts, the national media, and crazed football fans across the world. But how did they get here? To say the Jaguars have paid their dues as a struggling team in the NFL for the past decade and a half would be quite an understatement. From 2011 to 2016, they averaged less than four wins per season. That is insane in today's NFL. Just completely incomprehensible. Imagine the bravery, naivety, and love you have to have for this team, for any team, to tailgate and attend a game in 95 degree heat after back to back to back to back, you get it, losing seasons. And despite picking in the top 10 every season, not one of these draft picks during this, this six year stretch lasted in Jacksonville beyond their rookie contract. If you can sense some frustration in my tone, it's because I was and am one of those brave, naive fans with an unconditional love for this team. Hope was not abundant in Duval as the 2016 season neared its end and ownership's frustration finally boiled over into action. In December of 2016, head coach Gus Bradley was fired after a 2-12 start. It was truly a new era in Jacksonville. In the beginning of January, they promoted interim head coach Doug Marone to head coach, but owner Shad Khan didn't stop there. They decided to bring in a familiar face, Tom Coughlin, as executive VP of football operations. It was an inspiring, nostalgia-filled reunion. Coughlin coached the Jags from 95 to 2002. He was the expansion franchise's first ever head coach and had a 68 and 60 record during his time there. Since his departure from Jacksonville, he coached the Giants for 12 seasons, winning two Super Bowls. With his highly regarded football acumen, it was clear he was going to be the visionary of the rebuilding organization entering the 2017 season. Coughlin and company got busy making some foundational defensive acquisitions in free agency. Much needed after finishing 25th in points allowed the season prior. This began with the addition of Pro Bowl defensive end Calais Campbell, who spent the first nine years of his career in Arizona. They also brought in a familiar face from within the division, cornerback A.J. Bouye, formerly of the Houston Texans, to play opposite of emerging second-year star Jalen Ramsey. Defense wasn't the only issue, though. The Jaguars also finished 25th in points scored in 2016. They addressed this most significantly with the selection of LSU's star running back, Leonard Fournette, fourth overall in the draft. Being the highest selected running back of the draft class, Fournette was coming off a very productive college career, totaling over 4,300 yards and 41 touchdowns in his three seasons in the SEC. And Jacksonville was preparing to use him as the workhorse he showed he could be. Considerable momentum was building as the season arrived in 2017. The foundation for what would soon be called Saxonville was laid in week one versus an inspired Houston Texans team when the Jaguars racked up 10 sacks versus a division rival, blowing them out 29 to seven. Although many fans wouldn't be ecstatic over a four and three start, Jacksonville fans were absolutely lit. You couldn't tell us anything, and that hope continued to materialize further after one week's rest. They finished the regular season winning six of their final nine, heading into the postseason for the first time since 2007. Ten year gap. They had a 10-6 record, a division title, and the opportunity to host the six-seeded Buffalo Bills in the wild card round. We were hosting a playoff game. The curse was truly lifted. The wild card game against the Bills was a true definition of the phrase, a win is a win. The game's leading rusher between both teams was quarterback Blake Bortles, gaining more yardage on the ground than he did in the air. He did throw one touchdown though. It was the game's only touchdown. It was a one yard pass to tight end Ben Koyak. Saxonville really showed up in that game, limiting Buffalo to only three points. This was undoubtedly the team's strength the entire season. They finished second in the league in forced turnovers, total yards allowed, and sacks, certainly earning the nickname Saxonville. The only defense to have more sacks than the Jags in 2017 were the Steelers, 
who just so happened to be their divisional round opponent. We traveled up to Pittsburgh and arrived at temperatures nearing single digits. In what should have been a defensive battle, both teams ended up scoring over 40 points. The most impressive performance came from Fournette, who boasted over 100 yards and three touchdowns. Despite Pittsburgh's late efforts of playing catch-up for the latter part of the afternoon, Jacksonville outlasted the two-seed Steelers by a field goal. They were now tasked with a defending Super Bowl champion, New England Patriots, in the AFC Championship game. After an entire decade of irrelevance and hopelessness, we are one win away from the Super Bowl. The Jaguars were surprisingly in the driver's seat for a majority of this game, and even held a 10-point lead at the start of the fourth quarter, but the game ended with sort of a little bit of controversy. On the Patriots' first drive of the final quarter, star linebacker Miles Jack stripped the ball from running back Deion Lewis. Jack subsequently picked it up and began to run in what would have been a clear path to the end zone, going up 17 points with just 13 minutes left of the game. However, officials ruled the play dead immediately after the fumble recovery, giving the Jaguars poor field position. And ultimately, the Patriots forced several clutch three and outs and put up 14 fourth quarter points to beat the Jags and end Jacksonville's 2017 season. Forever immortalizing the phrase, Miles Jack wasn't down. Despite the letdown of the Patriots game, it was a monumental year for the franchise. Expectations in Jacksonville were now raised after being so close to their first Super Bowl appearance and fans thought this could soon be the regular in Jacksonville. In February, the team and Blake Bortles agreed to a three-year, $54 million contract extension. The team began 2018 winning three out of their first four, including a 31-20 vengeful stomping of the New England Patriots. But they immediately went on a seven-game losing skid. They finished the season upholding their defensive identity, but ended 31st in total points and limped into the offseason with a 5-11 record. Amidst the abysmal offensive production, Doug Marone decided to let go of offensive coordinator Nathaniel Hackett in late November. Because of course, it's the OC's fault. It was also time for the Jaguars to move on from a different key piece on offense. Since he was drafted third overall out of UCF in 2014, Blake Bortles had not lived up to the draft capital spent on him. His time in Jacksonville was up after five seasons. With a weak quarterback draft class presenting itself in 2019, the Jaguars decided to pursue the Super Bowl MVP from only two seasons prior, Nick Foles. Foles had impressive success as a backup in Philadelphia for several years, and the Jags decided it was worth a four-year, $88 million contract to be their starter. Foles wasn't viewed as a flashy top-end quarterback talent. However, this team's identity was still heavily defensive, and Foles certainly offered stability for a franchise that had truly never had that at that position. Presumably set at quarterback, the Jaguars spent their first two draft picks on whom they viewed as future cornerstones of the defense and offensive lines. Josh Allen, outside linebacker of Kentucky, and Jawan Taylor, offensive tackle out of Florida. After an incredibly disappointing 28th season following their conference championship appearance in 2017, Jaguars were yet again hopeful to return to that status. Nick Foles and company laced up week one to host reigning league MVP Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs. Chiefs got out to a quick 10-0 start and looked to have control early. And to make matters worse, Nick Foles didn't last to see the second quarter. He exited not even 10 minutes into the game, and it was later revealed his collarbone was broken, causing him to miss the next eight games. He was replaced by rookie Gardner Minshew, the team's six-round selection from 2019 out of Washington State. Minshew, like Foles, was by no means viewed as top-end talent as well, but Minshew, unlike Foles, brought a fiery, personality and mobility to the position. This gave Jacksonville somewhat of a spark, even going 4-4 four four behind the young quarterback in Foles' absence, much to a lot of fans' surprise. But clouding the excitement of watching Gardner Minshew play quarterback and leading the team to a handful of exciting wins was the discontent of one of the team's cornerstone pieces, outspoken yet extremely talented all-pro cornerback Jalen Ramsey. After a blow-up with Doug Marone on the sidelines in Week 2 versus the Texans, and what we now know today as a shaky relationship with hard-headed Tom Coughlin, Jalen Ramsey requested a trade. While Ramsey's talents were being shopped for a suitor, he remained out of action with a highly criticized and skeptical back injury, which magically healed after his trade request was granted mid-October, sending him to the LA Rams for two first-round draft picks. Foles did eventually return, but it was much to be desired in the eyes of Doug Marone. Midway through his third start, he was benched for Minshew. The Jags ended up winning only two games behind Minshew for the remainder of 2019, finishing the season with an underwhelming 6-10 record and sitting once again at the bottom of the AFC South. 
Hope was again growing bleak in Jacksonville. Many around the league had to have been thinking 2017 was a fluke season for the Jags, as 2018-2019 looked like the Jags many have grown accustomed to for the better part of the past decade. The 2020 offseason arrived after sh short months, coming with the surprising news that Jacksonville was shipping Nick Foles off to Chicago for a fourth round draft pick. Jags fans were pleasantly surprised at the return they got on that one. In addition to Foles' exit, the directionless franchise decided to let Calais Campbell walk in free agency and also decided to trade away A.J. Bouye for another fourth-round pick, both foundational pieces to the team's defensive identity. Saxonville was dead. The offseason didn't get much better as the weeks progressed. Jacksonville failed to attract any high-profile free agents and then went on to spend their two first-round selections on two defensive busts in C.J. Henderson out of Florida and Caleb Von Chason out of LSU. Henderson, who was taken ninth overall, only ended up playing for the Jags in 10 games before he was traded to Carolina. 2017 was a fluke, and the old Jaguars were back and here to stay. Disgruntled players continued to pop up in Duval. Just two weeks prior to week one, the Jaguars decided to trade productive edge rusher Yannick Ngakwe, and also shockingly released former first round pick Leonard Fournette. The loss of these players added to the long list of talent that had exited the building since the glorious 2017 run, making for a hopeless 2020 campaign. The Jags started the season with a shocking Week 1 victory at home over the divisional rival Indianapolis Colts, sparking a bit of what-if conversations among Jags fans who were hoping Minshew could maybe be the quarterback savior that we've been praying for for so long. Unfortunately, the Jaguars proceeded to lose the next 13 games, cycling backup quarterbacks in and out of rotation. But it was around the holiday season when Jags fans had their eyes on a new prize. It was becoming very evident that this was going to be the last year in college for the generational prospect, Clemson quarterback Trevor Lawrence. And for the first 13 weeks of the regular season, Jets fans were already buying their custom Lawrence Jets jerseys. As bad as the Jaguars were playing, the Jets were worse. Until week 14. To the utter shock of every fan, media personality, and probably every NFL player on that field that day, the putrid New York Jets defeated the star-studded Los Angeles Rams 23-20. That same week, the Jaguars suffered their 13th loss in a row, falling 40-14 to the Ravens. Due to very confusing and complex strength of schedule and tiebreaker math, the Jaguars now held the first pick in the NFL Draft and the rights to select Trevor Lawrence. All they had to do was lose their last two games. Great news, they did. They were very good at that that year, which ultimately led to the firing of head coach Doug Marone immediately following their Week 17 loss. In a vacuum, the Jaguars may have appeared to have hit rock bottom yet again. From 2018 to 2020, their yearly win total re had regressed back to the average of four. They had no head coach, no quarterback, and void of any true team identity. Despite all this, many fans had left 2020 with a completely new feeling of excitement. And that feeling stemmed from that 21-year-old from Cartersville, Georgia. Generational prospect, national champion, Clemson quarterback, Trevor Lawrence. Lawrence was viewed as the best quarterback prospect since the former Stanford quarterback, Andrew Luck. Standing at 6'6", six six, Lawrence had the size, athleticism, accuracy, mechanics, and all other intangibles that came along with being the face of the franchise. He was a slam dunk, can't miss, franchise altering pick. Now that the Jaguars had seemingly stumbled into a franchise rebirth, the next significant piece needed as a look to the future was filling the head coach position. By mid-January, Shad Khan coaxed Urban Meyer out of the Fox Sports booth and into the NFL for the very first time. Meyer had won three national championships at the collegiate level, most recently at Ohio State in 2014, with his first being at the University of Florida in the late 2000s. So Jacksonville fans were very familiar with him. He had never coached in the NFL before, which sparked skepticism from some. However, he was clearly successful as a college coach, and Khan expected that to translate at the professional level. To no one's surprise, Lawrence was the Jaguars' selection with the first pick. The Jaguars also had the 25th overall pick acquired from the Rams in the Jalen Ramsey trade. To the surprise of many, Trevor Lawrence's college teammate Travis Etienne was taken with this pick. And on a team void of so much talent, one of the only bright spots the year before was Jaguars' surprise rookie running back, James Robinson. He was signed as an undrafted free agent and impressively totaled over 1,400 yards and 10 touchdowns. This pick of ETN showed that Robinson was not the new regime's desired running back of the future, which many fans were actually hoping he would be. 
Unfortunately, we weren't able to see an Etienne Robinson tandem backfield in 2021. During the preseason, Travis Etienne suffered a Liz Frank injury that put him on a season-long injured reserve. If this misfortune wasn't foreshadowing of the season to come, it became very obvious weeks later. The Jaguars were absolutely pummeled in Urban and Trevor's first ever NFL game when they played the Texans and lost 37 to 21. And after three consecutive losses to open the season, the Jags traveled to Cincinnati in late September to face the Bengals on Thursday night football. A homecoming, one could say, for Urban Meyer, who had experienced great success during his seven years in Columbus, only about 100 miles northeast of Cincinnati. In a very competitive battle, the Jaguars fell just short to the Bengals by a field goal. But the game itself wasn't the most memorable part of the trip. Meyer, who decided not to fly back with the team post-game, stayed in Ohio to allegedly visit with friends and family. Video had surfaced days later of an unidentified woman dancing on him at the bar he had visited post-loss against the Bengals. Meyer apologized to the media and the team but it was at the expense of jokes amongst the locker room and league-wide mockery. Weeks later, Urban Meyer and the Jaguars finally earned their first win. Traveling to London to face the Dolphins, the Jags got solid performances out of Lawrence, Robinson, and Marvin Jones, capping off the game with a 53-yard field goal at the buzzer for Matthew Wright to seal it. This momentum briefly carried over to the U.S. Only two weeks later, the Jaguars shockingly took down AFC powerhouse Buffalo Bills 9-6, at home in early November. Some could say the Jaguars were beginning to gain some traction under Urban Meyer and rookie quarterback Trevor Lawrence, but unfortunately the hype train fell off its tracks. The team continued to stack up loss after loss for the next few months, and things truly began to unravel in the beginning of December. Rumors had begun to surface that Urban Meyer benched James Robinson, whose carries were growing significantly limited. Lawrence publicly called for Robinson to get more touches, but his workload remained unaffected. News then came to light that Meyer allegedly questioned the credibility of his assistant coaches. In a locker room speech, he had called himself a winner and apparently called the other coaches in the room all losers. This, of course, was not well received internally and around the league. The game immediately following this story resulted in a shutout by their division rival, the Tennessee Titans. And just when things couldn't have imaginably gotten any worse, another unsettling story of Meyer came out. At training camp the previous August, he reportedly kicked kicker Josh Lambeau, who had missed several field goals, in an exchange that allegedly went as follows. Hey dipshit, make your fucking kicks. I'm the head ball coach. I'll kick you whenever the fuck I want. This story was a nail in the coffin for Myers head coaching tenure, as he was fired the following morning after the report had been released. This was egg on the face of Shad Khan who was notably thrilled to have hired one of his football idols out of retirement and to coach the team he owned. Meyer left Jacksonville finishing with a record of 2-11, multiple scandals, and a franchise in disarray. He had also became the third head coach in NFL history to be fired before the end of the first season. And it is almost unanimously considered the worst NFL head coaching jobs of all time. Daryl Bevel had been named interim head coach and the Jaguars finished off their turbulent 2021 season with a matchup versus the Colts in what was deemed by fans and the national media as the clown-out game. With fears of their seemingly dysfunctional franchise set to ruin a once-in-a-lifetime prospect in Trevor Lawrence and to express their discontent with Shad Khan's ownership decisions and GM Trent Baalke's personnel decisions, fans dressed in clowns for the January 9th season finale versus the Colts, who were in a win-and-in scenario for the playoffs. The Jaguars shockingly upset the Colts, yet still remained in position to select first in the 2022 NFL Draft. As the Jaguars looked ahead to 2022, now on their third head coach in three seasons, this may have felt like a familiar rock bottom once again for the franchise. But a search for a new head coach can instill hope in any organization or fan base. This search went on for longer than many had planned or had hoped, and they ended on someone who may not necessarily have anticipated would become the new head coach. Initially, there was mutual interest in Byron Lethwich, former Jaguars quarterback and offensive coordinator for the Super Bowl winning Tampa Bay Buccaneers the season prior. The reports came out late in the interview process, however, that Lethwich did not want to work with current general manager Trent Baalke, so he withdrew his name from consideration for the job. Ownership then quickly pivoted to hire Doug Peterson a few days into February of 2022. Peterson had spent the prior season unemployed, 
After being relieved of head coaching duties by the Philadelphia Eagles in 2020, only three seasons after he had led the franchise to their only Super Bowl victory. Free agency began the following month and some interesting deals were made in Jacksonville. Most notably, they signed Christian Kirk to a four-year, $72 million contract. A sizable contract that took many by surprise, as Kirk had only been a solid complimentary receiver on the Cardinals at that point in his career. But the Jags didn't stop there dealing out hefty contracts. They also signed Zay Jones to a three-year, $24 million deal and former Giants tight end Evan Ingram to a one-year, $9 million deal. Trevor Lawrence now had a new arsenal of weapons to throw to. They were not big, splashy names by any means, but the group certainly improved from the season prior, and Jacksonville showed they were willing to invest a large financial commitment to the offense. After all, nothing was more important for this franchise than the development of Trevor Lawrence. In addition to these new offensive acquisitions, the Jaguars also picked up former Washington guard Brandon Sheriff and former Falcons linebacker Foye Oluokon. Both of these signings may have slipped under the radar to some, but both were solid players for their former teams that Peterson, Balky, and company hoped would contribute similarly and help rebuild a new culture in Jacksonville. The Jaguars were simultaneously on the clock during the several month stretch heading up to the NFL Draft. Unlike many draft cycles, there wasn't a clear-cut number one overall pick, and the Jags definitely benefited from not being in the quarterback market either. They eventually decided on selecting defensive lineman Trayvon Walker from the University of Georgia with the first overall pick. He was viewed as somewhat of a project in order to be successful at the NFL level, but his traits and athleticism were too prevalent for Trent Baalke and the Jaguars staff to pass up on, and they were confident they could mold him into a true NFL star. The Jaguars also traded up in the first round to select inside linebacker Devin Lloyd out of Utah. They appeared to have gotten their linebacker duo up the middle, pairing him with newly acquired Aluakon, who had led the NFL in tackles in 2021. As the NFL regular season approached, it truly felt different in Jacksonville. And a lot of this can be attributed to what Balky and Peterson were building in Duval. Despite the recent hardships for Jacksonville, they remained optimistic to make some noise in AFC South, with so many of their new, young, promising players paired with a handful of dependable veterans. For the week one matchup, they traveled up to Washington to face a franchise that also experienced their fair share of turmoil these past several seasons. The game included some excitement from the Jaguars' new faces, most notably Trayvon Walker getting his first sack and interception, but the team ultimately fell short 22-28. Those who thought same old Jags after this letdown weren't thinking it for very long. This was because they followed up that loss with a shutout win against the Indianapolis Colts, ousting them in Jacksonville 24-0. They then traveled up to Los Angeles to face the Chargers in Week 3, dominating them from start to finish in a crushing 38-10 win, exercising multiple demons from the past in the process. Despite a hobbled Justin Herbert, the Chargers were not expected to lose this one, and by no means were they expected to lose by four scores. The Jaguars were showing signs of life. The hype was suddenly buzzing in late September, just in time for a week four trip up north to face the undefeated NFC powerhouse Philadelphia Eagles. And the Jaguars jumped out to a quick 14-0 lead in the first quarter after a pick six from Andre Sisco, then a touchdown pass hauled in by Jamal Agnew. The Jags looked like they may be NFL elite, but momentum had unfortunately stalled as the game progressed as Trevor Lawrence did not fare well in the tough weather conditions, turning the ball over five times four of which were lost fumbles. This resulted in a 21 to 29 loss. This time, unfortunately, things didn't turn around so quickly. The Jaguars experienced four consecutive losses, dropping games to the Texans and the Broncos, both at the bottom of the AFC. They now sat at an uncomfortable two and six record as they prepared to host the Las Vegas Raiders on a warm November Sunday. Well, it felt like the season was going from bad to worse as Derek Carr and Devontae Adams connected on two first-half touchdowns as the score quickly turned 17-0. The sweaty, disheartened fans of Jacksonville began to voice their discouragement, but it was almost as if this was the motivation the Jaguars' sideline needed. As Travis Etienne punched in a one-yard touchdown before the half ended, this was then followed up by a Christian Kirk touchdown reception in the third quarter, and Etienne added another score on the ground. With the help of two Riley Patterson field goals, the Jaguars edged out a nail-biter to erase the early three-score deficit to defeat the Raiders at home. Come from behind, nail-biting win, and it became the staple from there on out. 
Three weeks later, fresh off their bye week, the Jaguars hosted the 7-3 Baltimore Ravens, who were well equipped to continue their quest to the postseason. This game was a back and forth one, it was a battle all day long, and it was looking as though the Ravens were going to edge out the contest by a slim margin, holding on to a seven point lead with only two minutes remaining. The outcome was becoming particularly imminent as Trevor Lawrence took a sack from former Jaguars Calais Campbell, setting up a third and 21, forcing the Jaguars to use their final timeout. But Trevor wasn't phased. He connected with Christian Kirk for 16 yards on third down, then Marvin Jones for another 10 yards on fourth. He followed up those two strikes with four more completions, leading the Jags down to the Ravens' 10-yard line with 18 seconds left. Trevor still remained unfazed. He took the snap on first down and delivered a beautiful jump ball to Marvin Jones, who barely managed to get his shin to touch the ground in the end zone. After extensive review of the touchdown, it stood as called. It was now 27 to 26, and as long as the PAT went through the uprights, this game was going to overtime. But Doug Peterson had other ideas. He had built a reputation as a coach who often goes for it on fourth down, and he let his true play calling color show here. He trots the offense out there for a two point attempt with the game on the line. You score, you win the game. You don't score, you lose. Trevor sends Zay Jones in motion, takes a snap out of the shotgun, fires it to Zay on a rope as he runs a quick out to the front left pylon. Before Ravens corner Brandon Stevens can adjust, the ball is already hauled in by Zay. The Jaguars perfectly executed a two-minute game-winning drive and stole an upset at home. We've been through a lot here in the past two years and just battled through adversity. Feels good, Trevor Lawrence said after the game. And this time, that good feeling stayed for the better part of the next month. After a road loss to Detroit immediately following the Ravens game, the Jags strung off four straight wins, a winning streak that included two dominating performances against division rivals putting up 30 points against both the Titans and the Texans. Also featured was an overtime come from behind thriller against one of the NFC's best in the Dallas Cowboys, one with a 52 yard walk off pick six by Rayshon Jenkins. The Jaguars had truly built momentum as they were preparing to host the Tennessee Titans in week 18 with the winner claiming the AFC South championship. While the Jaguars haven't even sniffed the title in the last five years, the Titans have been reigning champs of the division for the past two seasons. It was a brisk Saturday night in early January and the fans' energy was indicative of the game's stakes. It was playoff atmosphere in prime time in Jacksonville, Florida. The stadium was packed and Jags fans were desperate for the Jags to win. Coming up just short of the postseason after suffering for so long and for the season that they had would almost feel worse than their seasons of prior finishing at the bottom of the entire league. Despite the Titans quarterback, Josh Dobbs, being signed to the team only a few weeks prior, Tennessee jumped out to an early 10-0 lead as Dobbs connected for a 21-yard passing touchdown. Less than three minutes later though, Trevor answered back with a 25-yard touchdown pass to Christian Kirk, who had entered the game having racked up his first career 1,000-yard season. Despite the touchdown, Jags fans sat uneasy for most of the game not leading once throughout the first three quarters as the Titans stuck to their bread and butter, feeding Derrick Henry carries all night who notched over 100 yards on the ground. The sobering reality defeat was truly starting to set in for the crazed home crowd as Tennessee had possession with the fourth quarter clock dwindling. They were up 16 to 13, but a familiar hero on the Jacksonville defense had other ideas. Three minutes to go, third and six, Dobbs takes the snap. Rayshon Jenkins, who is disguised in coverage, attacks Dobbs' weak side and connects with his forearm as he pulled back to throw. Josh Allen proceeds to scoop up the fumble and run 35 yards into the end zone, instantly electrifying the postseason spirit of the Jacksonville fans once again. After a quick turnover on downs, the spirit remained. Fireworks shot up into the night skies. Teal AFC South champions flash across the big screen at TIAA Bank Field. The celebration couldn't last too long though. The Jaguars soon found out roughly 24 hours later that they were set to host the Chargers in their wildcard matchup. A familiar opponent whom they traveled across country to beat handedly a few months prior. As the week progressed and Saturday arrived, Jacksonville fans grew confident as their four score victory in September became a more pertinent memory. But in a story Jaguars fans knew all too well, their confidence rapidly disappeared 
as the first half unraveled before their eyes. Not even a minute into the game, Chargers linebacker Drew Tranquil comes down with an interception from Trevor Lawrence, which quickly turned into an Austin Eckler touchdown. Three interceptions by Asante Samuel Jr. later, the Jaguars found themselves in a 27-0 hole, not even at the end of the second quarter. Despite his four costly turnovers, Trevor Lawrence somehow salvaged any sort of confidence he had left and led the Jaguars down the field at the end of the first half with a touchdown pass to Evan Ingram. As the teams dispersed to the locker rooms after halftime, energy in Jacksonville was so low, embarrassment likely had begun to creep in. Their team had reached the playoffs for the first time in five years, only to put on this performance for a national audience. But that quick score to close out the half must have given the Jaguars' offense a little spark they needed. They slowly chopped at the Chargers' lead, kicked off with a Marvin Jones touchdown on the first possession of the third quarter. The Chargers answered back by immediately putting up three points of their own, but Trevor and the Jags' offense were firing on all cylinders at this point. They knew they had to score every time they touched the ball, and nothing was going to stop them from doing so. They responded with a five-play, 68-yard drive, capped off with a 39-yard touchdown by Zay Jones. And after a failed two-point conver conversion attempt, the margin was cut to 10 points, with a score 30-20. to 20. The Jaguars had been behind before. This was nothing new this season. In fact, how this game was going was perfectly symbolic for how their whole season had gone. And the Jags fan knew this too. That's why none of them left. As the third quarter turned into the fourth, the crowd was deafening. But the Chargers offense managed to milk seven minutes of game clock on a 14-play drive, ending up at the Jaguars' 22-yard line. But Jacksonville's bend-but-don't-break defense had paid off, but the Chargers' field goal attempt sailed wide left. Now, at their own 30-yard line, with eight minutes to play, down 10, Jacksonville's offense came back on the field. And despite a nine-yard sack to start the drive and three incompletions along the way, the resilient Jaguars group reached the end zone for the fourth time of the night, this time sealing the score with a successful two-point attempt by the outstretched diving arm of Trevor Lawrence. The score was now only 28-30. to 30. The momentum was now completely flipped. Brandon Staley had nothing to combat the Jaguars' defensive adjustments and his offense had little fight left in them. They went three and out and punted to the Jaguars' 21-yard line, barely holding on to their two-point lead with three minutes left. It almost seemed inevitable. Lawrence continued to show his poise. After a few completed passes to Kirk and Zay, in addition to a scramble for eight yards, the Jaguars were faced with fourth and inches on the Chargers' 41-yard line, just outside of comfortable field goal range. But what better playbook to rely on than Doug Peterson's on fourth and short. They line up with three in the backfield with Trevor under center. And while it may have felt obvious that Trevor's six foot six frame was going to be pushed forward to gain the first down, Peterson was planning to get a little bit more aggressive. Lawrence dropped back to hand off to ETN and with a gang of blockers pushing left, ETN takes off around the right end. And 25 yards later, he's being wrestled down to the ground at the Chargers 16 yard line staying in bounds in the process. The gutsy call and beautiful play design was executed to perfection. Then, Jaguars kicker Riley Patterson proceeded to convert the short field goal and the Jags had officially completed the third largest comeback in NFL playoff history. Every fan in attendance, as well as a national audience at home, had long forgotten about the pitiful first half performance. And suddenly, the subpar Jaguar teams of years past had felt so distant. Jacksonville was relevant once again. They had their head coach, their future at quarterback, and they had a team poised to contend with any opponent they crossed paths with. The Jaguars would go on to lose to the Kansas City Chiefs, as many do, in a divisional round trip to Arrowhead in a hard-fought battle. The Chiefs went on to eventually win the Super Bowl. The Jaguars were sort of quiet in free agency, preferring to keep and reward their own players in-house. Some notable offseason moves included signing Evan Ingram to a long-term contract, introducing a reinstated and reinvigorated Calvin Ridley to the roster and back to the NFL, and selecting offensive lineman Anton Harrison in the first round of the draft, tight end Brendan Strange in the second, and running back Tank Bigsby in the third. All sure to be immediate impact players in 2023. At the time of this recording, the Jaguars just defeated the Buffalo Bills to advance to 3-2 on the season. They are 11-5 in their last 16 games, with three of those losses to the Kansas City Chiefs, 
having lost to them again earlier in the 2023 season. 2022 was an unexpected thrill ride, much like 2017, but this time, it's no fluke. The Jaguars are faced with living up to high expectations set for them in 2023, and it looks like they could go on a run here soon. So here's to hoping it ends with finally unseating the Chiefs at the top of the AFC throne. Because led by Doug Peterson and Trevor Lawrence, this Jaguars team is no longer knocking at any elite doorstep. They're in fact already inside. Thank you.